is obscured by the monitor. Thank you very much, Ewan, for that very kind introduction. Can everybody hear? Yes. And is everybody sitting comfortably? The story uh, takes its origin from uh, a unique collection of hand-painted heraldic shields, which came into the possession of the Heraldry Society of Scotland some years ago. And I'm delighted to welcome the present chairman of the Heraldry Society of Scotland, Edward Mallinson, uh, to our audience today. Working with Professor Jim Floyd, who unfortunately can't be with us today, uh, our investigations revealed that um, the shields had been, faint, had been painted by a group of First World War officers who were mainly suffering from mental health problems as part of their occupational therapy while they were convalescing at uh, a big country house called Lennell House in the Scottish Borders. I would also like to give a very big welcome to uh, Cecilia McGregor, who is the great granddaughter of Lady Clementine Waring, who is going to be central to today's story. But before I start with the story of the Shields and the mental health initiative that accompanied them, I would like to pay tribute 
to the late Sir Maurice Blogg himself, whose generosity endowed the lecture series that we enjoyed today. He was born in Lithuania on the 8th of February 1883, not very far from where my own great-grandparents came from, although they left for the UK some decade or so earlier. At the age of 10, Maurice Block arrived with his parents in Dundee, where he went to school. And on the, 10th of August, on the 25th of August, 1910, by now living in Glasgow, he became a naturalised British subject. Um, some sources, including his newspaper obituary, say that he was born in Dundee, but of course, if that had been the case, he'd have been British by birth and he wouldn't have needed to be naturalised. So the fact that his naturalisation papers are held at the National Archives in London clearly established that he was born overseas. You'd be delighted to know that he set up a whiskey business in, in Glasgow, initially uh, as Bloch Brothers, but as the company expanded, um, he then founded the firm of A. Gillies & Company, which remains a thriving business operating the Glen Scotia Distillery in Campbelltown. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome another very special guest today, um, Master Distiller Richard Patterson OBE himself, who's here with us in the audience. Um, known to many of his followers as The Nose, from his ability to um, blend whiskey, um, whose first excursions into the whiskey business were in the firm of A. Gillis, which was founded by Maurice Block himself. In later life, Morris retired from business to concentrate on his civic, community and philanthropic activities. He was a most generous donor, and his endowments included not only our own series of lectures, but also the main lecture theatre at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, which is named in his honour. He was knighted in 1937 for political and social services. Through his generosity, his enduring spirit lives on not only in Campbelltown, but also here in Glasgow. But to go back to the beginning of his career, he'd only been in Glasgow for four years when the First World War broke out. Why wasn't he called up into uniform? He was young enough. We don't know, but as the portrait shows him wearing very thick glasses, it may be that his eyesight wasn't good enough and he failed the medical. Anyway, despite hopeful promises that it would all be over by Christmas, the First World War was to go on for four long years, involving nearly every family and costing the lives of nearly three quarters of a million Britons. Many more would be injured in the course of the conflict, some on more than one occasion, and many with life-changing consequences. We tend to think of amputation as being one of the signature injuries of the recent conflict in Afghanistan. But by the end of the First World War, there were some 41,000 British troops who sustained and survived the loss of a limb. There were also the hidden wounds of war. Surprisingly, perhaps, there are no reliable figures for the number of mental health casualties, but it was at least one in 25 of all hospital admissions. And according to Sir Frederick Mott, they made up at least one in seven of all service personnel who were medically discharged from military service. Mott was an important figure in psychiatry in the early years of the 20th century. He was something of a polymath, but his most important interest lay in disorders of the mind. He was a pioneer of the Maudsley Hospital in London, which was in fact completed in 1915. And so when it opened for admissions, it wasn't known as the Maudsley Hospital, it was immediately designated as a military hospital, the fourth London General Hospital. He served as a medical officer in the RAMC and received his knighthood after the war. Incidentally, his wife, Dame Georgiana Mott, seems to have been a very feisty lady. She was a strong campaigner for women's suffrage. And on the 1921 census, she wrote against her entry on the census, desires the parliamentary vote. It was as late as 1928, so less than 100 years ago, before the vote was granted to all women aged over 21. And I think we don't realize just how recently uh, that, that came to pass. Mythology seems to be an inevitable accompaniment to the history of military psychiatry, and indeed to military health in general, and Sir Frederick Mott's family was not immune to this mythology. Some sources say that all his sons were killed during the First World War, but having searched through the records, I can find no evidence that he ever had any sons, looking at the census at the time that he and his wife got married and at intervals thereafter, although he and his wife did have four daughters. <coughs> Another well-worn chestnut is that shell shock was a soldier's illness, whilst officers had neurasthenia, which sounded much more posh. Again, the evidence doesn't support this at all, and I've seen many officers' clinical records which, which clearly show a diagnosis of shell shock. In fact, shell shock was one of the more common diagnoses 
um, in the officers who were patients at Lennell House next to neurasthenia. Debility was also common and often followed infections such as malaria or dysentery or later in the war, influenza, because of course there was the Spanish flu pandemic towards the end of the war. The so-called disordered action of the heart and valvular disease of the heart, which was often recorded on the clinical records, was also really common. And a lot of these patients were followed up in the 1920s. Um, and generally, they showed no residual sign of heart disease, which added to the evidence in support of these symptoms too, being psychiatric in origin. One thing that's often overlooked, though, is the mental health effects of being attacked by poison gas, which, of course, was a, a, something that happened a lot um, later in the war. It was graphically expressed by one soldier as being more frightening than being shot at, because at least you could see um, where your enemy was. <clears throat> but these clouds of greenish, offensive-smelling gas rolling towards you across the hills um, was something very, very frightening indeed. <clears throat> And we mustn't forget that some of those who were hospitalised with apparent mental health issues were in fact um, suffering from physical organic conditions, and particularly neurosyphilis, which was still quite common at that time in the absence of any antibiotics. A diagnosis of shell shock required significant exposure to blast, and some of the stories are really quite harrowing. For example, being trapped in rubble, buried for hours, sometimes next to the remains of their comrades, and not knowing when or even if they'd be rescued. We might also con consider these days whether mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI was a factor in some cases, or whether there was a parallel with the historical condition called wind of ball, which was well known in Nelson's Navy, whereby a man could be killed by a cannonball passing close to him, but not actually hitting him even if it didn't physically touch him. So is there um, a link between shell shock and that wind of ball situation? Again, we, we really don't know. Neurasthenia, by contrast, has quite a long history. Unlike um, shell shock, which was first described in 1915, neurasthenia was recognized as early as, as 1829, and it was characterized by extreme fatigue, commonly seen in people who'd been working very long hours in stressful conditions. Um, and traditionally, it was treated by rest, although that was to prove ineffective in these military combat-related cases. And a, an Edinburgh doctor, Dr. A.J. Brock, proposed a more active form of management, and we'll meet uh, Dr. Brock shortly. After the war, a government inquiry was set up to look into shell shock and related conditions. Interestingly, though, these were not grouped together as mental disorders, as we call them today. The combat-related conditions were regarded as war neuroses, and the view was expressed that if patients believed they had a mental disorder, they wouldn't just feel stigmatized by society, which was much more of a problem then than it is now, but they would be much less likely to get better. They, they would believe that they had a permanent condition. Um, and if you called it war neuroses, there was a, a feeling that once the war was over, they ought to get better. So you have to wonder whether there's a message for us today here. In the course of the inquiry, Sir Frederick Mott, who was called to give evidence, um, had described what he considered to be the fundamentals of treatment, which really centered around keeping the mind occupied. And again, perhaps there are lessons for today. The comment that he makes uh, in this list about not being over solicitous is interesting. And just the other day I heard um, someone working with traumatized veterans, saying that many of them actually respond much better to a robust approach. After all, it might be a cliche, but as soldiers, they were used to being ordered about. Which brings us on to Dr. Brock. Before the war, he'd been the physician in charge of the TB sanatorium in Edinburgh, uh, close to the Astley Enzi Hospital. And he found that neurasthenia-type symptoms tended to develop in patients who were kept in bed for long periods with nothing to occupy them. So he pioneered what he called ergotherapy, which was actually an early form of occupational therapy, which wasn't really known at that time. And then in 1917, by now he was serving as a captain in the RMC, he was posted to Craig Lockhart War Hospital in Edinburgh, which was a hospital for mentally traumatized officers. At Craig Lockhart, Dr. Brock was able to develop this into a treatment regime based on reintegrating the patients and they'd suffered from the consequences of exposure to a highly abnormal situation, often fighting in the trenches, 
completely different from anything they'd ever encountered in their civilian lives. And what he wanted to do was try and integrate them back into the normal world and reassure them that despite their war experiences, there was actually a real normal world out there. And ergotherapy proved to be the key. We hear a lot about Dr. Rivers, who was Siegfried Sassoon's doctor at Craig Lockhart, but arguably Dr. Brock's work was equally important. Fortunately, we know a lot about life at Craig Lockhart from the pages of the Hydra, which was the in-house magazine, which was actually edited by the patients themselves, including, um, at one point, the war poet Wilfred Owen, who was its editor. Um, we know, therefore, that uh, at Craig Lockhart there were many clubs for the officers to participate in, and even excursions run by Captain Brock himself, in the course of which, no doubt, he used to chat to the patients as they were walking along and take the opportunity to explore um, in a very non-confrontational and non-clinical non um, environment some of their underlying issues. And again, the approach to normalization is interesting. And we can see, for example, an art club rather than art therapy, even though the activities were the same. So the emphasis was very much on normalization, getting people out of the sick role, and there's evidence that it proved very effective, as many of them actually were eventually able to return to duty. But where did they go after Craig Lockhart to complete the recovery? We now turn to a senior officer in the army, um, an RMC doctor, um, Sir Alfred Keogh. And at the beginning of the war, Sir Alfred Keogh realized the need for additional medical facilities. He realized that particularly with no National Health Service, but even had we had those facilities, um, there was no way that the existing civilian medical facilities would have been able to cope. So he requisitioned a very large number of public buildings and large private buildings to use as convalescent homes and auxiliary hospitals. And one such was Lenel House in the borders, um, on the outskirts of Coldstream. And Lenel House belonged to Lady Clementine and Major Walter Waring. Lady Clementine was the eldest child and only surviving daughter of William Montague Hay, the, the 10th Marquess of Tweeddale, and his wife, Candida Louise Bartolucci. After a career in the Indian Civil Service, the Marquess had eventually returned to Scotland, where he became the MP for Haddington. Lady Clementine had three brothers, one of whom would be killed in action in the first weeks of the war, while one of her other brothers, Lord Edward Douglas John Hay, would be killed in 1944 in the bombing of the Guards Chapel in London. The Warings had two daughters, one of whom was still a toddler at the start of the war. In 1901, Lady Clementine had married Major Walter Waring, who was the son of the MP for Poole. He was a career army officer who would later hold parliamentary office himself. He was born in 1876 and educated at Eton, and he joined the lifeguards in 1897, serving in the Second Boer War in South Africa, and he was promoted to captain in 1904. By the outbreak of the First World War, he was serving in the Lothians and Border Horse, which was a, a yeomanry regiment, part of the territorial force, and that had been raised in its original form in uh, as early as 1797. After a short period living in London, the Warings moved to Scotland and bought Lennel House, which had been built about 1818 for Lord Haddington, to a design by the architect John Patterson. It was a fine country mansion on the banks of the River Tweed and came with extensive grounds, stables, salmon fishing, hunting, and even its own golf course, which the Warings brought back into use. Walter Waring's unit was liable for overseas service during the First World War, although they didn't in fact deploy until September 1915. But in the meantime, the Warings wanted to contribute to the war effort. The first major action of the war had been the German invasion of Belgium in violation of the 1839 Treaty of London, which had declared Belgium as a neutral state. The invasion began on the 4th of August 1914, and by the 31st of October of that year, Belgium had fallen to the Germans. Inevitably, Belgian civilians were the innocent victims of the invasion, and many were killed, taken hostage, or captured for forced labor. And I think we, we're seeing concepts here that resonate with today's situation in various parts of the world. The lucky ones crossed the border into Holland and escaped as refugees, some making their way to Britain. By the middle of October, the Warings had opened their home to nine Belgian refugees, and a month later, they extended their hospitality to eight convalescent Belgian officers. 
Their generosity at this time is all the more remarkable since Lady Clementine was in mourning for her brother, Lord Arthur Hay, who'd been killed at the First Battle of Aine only a month earlier. But perhaps neither Lady Clementine nor her husband had any idea at that stage where their hospitality was to lead. In 1915, Major Waring's battalion deployed to France following a period of pre-deployment training at Sutton Veny on Salisbury Plain. Here we can see the battalion on parade being inspected um, by the corpulent gentleman in the front who is the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, Robert Kirk Inches, who in his civilian career was a goldsmith and silversmith and co-founder of the jewellers Hamilton and Inches, which still exists today and some of you may know it. The blurred picture on the right is a rare intimate glimpse into the human side of deployment for war. In less than comfortable surroundings, we can see the commander of A Squadron, Major Waring, seated on the ground. To his left, Lieutenant Thomas Robson Scott, who commanded number three troop. Lady Clementine Waring, perched on the sacking. The commander of number two troop, Lord Charles, uh, Lieutenant Lord Charles Hope, and his mother, the most honorable Hersey Hope, the Marchioness of Linlithgow, gathered to say farewell the evening before they left for France. The families, no doubt, would have uppermost in their minds the wonder of whether they would ever see their loved ones again. But with her husband now away on active service, Lady Clementine was now at home with her two daughters, the 11-year-old Clematis, who was later to become the mother of Sir Isla Campbell, and the toddler Cecilia, known as Kitty. Lenel was now fully functional as a convalescent home. At that stage, patients were coming from hospitals all over the country, as it would be still another year towards the end of 1916, before Craig Lockhart opened and became a major source of Lennell's patients. The auxiliary hospitals were organized on a formal basis, including having their own printed stationery and clinical records, as we can see here. We don't know exactly how many officers were treated at Lennell, as there's no single source of information, but about 450 over the course of the war seems likely. The surviving hundred or so clinical records show a wide diversity of cases, both physical and mental. And later in the war, as the Spanish flu pandemic began to take hold, a number of the patients were suffering from debility after an attack of flu, perhaps paralleling the long, long COVID that we're seeing today. Even Lady Clementine herself succumbed to influenza, although she appears to have fortunately made a good recovery. We may perhaps note that there is here a tacit recognition that all physical illnesses and injuries are accompanied by some degree of mental consequences, a lesson that we really only recently relearned. It's quite clear that it was the same activities of normal life as we'd later see at Craig Lockhart, which Lennell tried to promote. So we find officers fishing in the tweed, going out for picnics, putting on plays, and even going out shooting. Now, we might wonder about people with mental health problems going shooting, but of course these were country gentlemen to whom a day's shooting was a normal activity. Um, and in fact we have um, a piece of wood which was salvaged from a tree which was cut down at Lennell, which has embedded in it a bullet which was identified as coming from an officer's revolver. And it seems likely that the poor tree was used for some target practice at, at one stage. They also uh, went out um, doing other activities during fine weather, but when the weather was not so good, they had to do indoor activities, and some of that would have been putting on plays, but also they were introduced to painting heraldry, and we'll look at that in more detail shortly. It all sounds very similar to Dr. Brock's ergotherapy, but bear in mind that Dr. Brock didn't even go to Craig Lockhart uh, until some time after this. So, Clearly, he's been using this with his TB patients before the war in Edinburgh. Did Lady Clementine know him, or did she read about his treatments? Or was it the other way around? Did Craig Rocker copy Lennell? We just don't know, sadly. But we need to have another look, uh, and a closer look, at the heraldic painting classes. So, why heraldry, you may ask? Well, we know from family sources that Lady Clementine was keenly interested in heraldry, and round the beams of the big hall, that you can see here, hung the coats of arms of everybody who'd ever visited Lennel. Faced with many new visitors, adding to the collection was clearly a logical step, whilst at the same time providing another strand to the rehabilitation of the officers. <laughs> 
But let's now meet some of the officers themselves and hear their stories, framed by the heraldry that was painted either by them or, in some cases, with the assistance of others who were more artistically gifted. As we do so, we'll learn some more about their wartime experiences, but crucially, we'll follow them through into later life and see what happened to these people as they went on through the rest of their lives once the war was over. First of all, though, a quick primer on heraldry. You often hear the phrase family crest, something that makes heraldic experts wince. There's no such thing as a family crest. And what you can see here is a full coat of arms, or known as an achievement of arms, which is made up of a shield, a helmet, and on top of the helmet, the crest, which is the bit on the top. The two animals um, on the sides are called supporters, but not every coat of arms has those. And in Scotland, every coat of arms is unique to an individual, rather like a personal trademark, and they can be inherited usually from father to eldest son. So if somebody um, goes to one of these bucket shops and buys a coat of arms for their name, it's not actually their coat of arms, unless it's been formally issued to them by Lord Lyon, but that's another story. Let's now meet Major Clough. He was a career officer who was commissioned into the King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment on the 4th of May, 1898. He was the son of the Reverend John Clough of Welford Rectory in Nottinghamshire. The battalion saw very heavy action at Ypres in May of 1915, and in one disastrous day, the commanding officer was killed and Major Clough had to assume command as um, a rather more junior officer than the CEO would have been. By the end of the day, though, he was one of only 40 survivors in his regiment. Now, a regiment typically is 700 people, so um, you, you can imagine. And, of course, the first day of the Somme, uh, there were 16,000 fatalities just in the one day. So numbers we can't even um, dream about in our worst nightmares today. One might have thought that that was sufficient trauma for anyone's nerve to crack, but a surviving letter to Lady Clementine suggests that he was actually hospitalised with a physical illness because he was transferred to Craig Leith War Hospital in Edinburgh, which treated physical conditions and is not to be confused with Craig Lockhart. Um, so while he was in hospital, he was complaining about the foul-tasting medicine and frequent monitoring of his temperature that was going on. Unfortunately, we've not been able to find his clinical record, so we don't know what he was suffering from then. But he actually remained in service after the war, and he then went on to serve in Iraq and in Bombay between 1922 and 1923. But eventually, the trauma of his service caught up with him, and he succumbed to neurasthenia. And in mid-1923, he was placed on half pay on account of ill health. So that's basically a type of retirement for a senior officer. In 1935, though, he didn't lose contact with the military. He was appointed a military knight of Windsor, which entitled him to reside at Windsor Castle, where he stayed for the rest of his life. And his funeral in 1970, at the age of 94, took place in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. He retained an interest in heraldry, which may have been stimulated by his experiences at Lanel, and I'm delighted to have at home his handbook of heraldry, which bears his own armorial book plate now slightly different from the one that he painted at Lennel, and indicating that what he painted was actually his father's coat of arms before he was later on granted his own. This splendid coat of arms presented a major challenge in identification. On the reverse, it simply says Faulkner, spelled with two E's, which wasn't much help. Eventually, we were able to link it to this officer in the Royal Field Artillery, whose photograph from Lennel is, is captioned Captain Desmond Morton. Again, not an immediate association with the name Faulkner. He joined the army as a career officer in 1911, and on the outbreak of war, he progressed rapidly, becoming a staff captain in 1915. He was awarded the Military Cross during the Somme Offensive, but in March 1917, he was hit in the chest by a machine gun bullet in action near Arras. The bullet lo lodged close to his, his heart, probably underneath his aortic arch, actually, and it was de deemed far too dangerous at that time to operate, so he was just sent to Lennel to recover from the injury, still with his bullet. He never fully recovered his health. He always had a weak chest after that. But by July of 1917, he was considered fit enough to return to France, where he became the ADC to Sir Douglas Haig, 
which really presaged a, a glittering, if somewhat clandestine, career in the civil service after the war, when he became head of the Industrial Intelligence Center of the Committee for Imperial Defense. In 1940, though, still moving in high circles, he was appointed PA to Sir Winston Churchill. And in fact, if you go to the cabinet war rooms in London today, you can see his desk and his office down there with his name on it. And um, in 1945, such was his service during the Second World War that he received a knighthood. He, he never married, but again, he died in his 90th year after a very successful career. Lieutenant Arthur Nicol Bruce served in the 7th Battalion, the Royal Scots. He was born in Banff in 1888. He was the fourth son of the Reverend William Stratton Bruce, who was the minister of the parish of, Ban of Banff. Now, you might notice uh, a preponderance of people who were sons of the manse, and that does seem to be a bit of a risk factor for developing mental health problems during the war. Um, and also some of those who had no background in the church, nonetheless, after the war, went on um, to become ministers themselves. Um, so it does suggest that perhaps having that sort of rather sensitive personality um, and being more used to seeing the, um, the better side of life um, made you a little bit more likely to develop mental health problems during the war. So um, Lieutenant Bruce's father was the son of William Bruce and Janet Stratton, which probably explains why this shield is actually for Stratton of Lauriston and not Bruce as we might expect. He was a qualified lawyer, and in fact he was a writer to the signet, and so uh, a senior lawyer before the war, but he served as an infantry officer in the Royal Scots. He became ill with dengue fever, which is a mosquito-borne infection, and he never fully recovered his, his health. So he was sent to Bow Hill, which was another of the border satellite hospitals, the auxiliary hospitals, um, and it was um, the home of the Duke of Buccleu. Um, and he was sent there to convalesce, and from there he went on to Lenor. But his heart was giving cause for concern because um, dengue can damage the heart. And eventually he was medically discharged from service. He returned to his legal practice after the war and later he became secretary of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. He was elected a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in 1923. But in 1943, he died suddenly at the age of 55, possibly related to the late effects of his wartime illness on his heart. Captain Henry Mellish came from a military family in Guernsey. He joined the Army Service Corps, which became the Royal Corps of Transport, which later became the Royal Logistic Corps, um, in 1911, and he was posted overseas on the 23rd of August, 1914. He came back from France on leave at the end of April, 1917, uh, having been there for two and a half years, shortly after handing over command of the 47th Divisional Supply Column to Captain Philip Temple Seabee. So he'd been in France for most of the war and commanding a divisional supply column, which was responsible for transporting uh, supplies up to the front. So uh, a job involving great responsibility. Um, he must have been working extremely hard. And he was actually suffering from neurasthenia symptoms. Um, and he asked to be examined by a medical board, in other words, um, a, a team of medical officers who actually came to his house um, to examine him. Um, and as a result of that, he was admitted to the 4th London General Hospital, which we met earlier, which later became the Maudsley Hospital. Um, and he came under the care of Major, later Sir Frederick Mott, whom we met earlier. He did well, and um, he was transferred to Lennel on the 3rd of August, 1917. But about six weeks later, on the 14th of September, he became acutely unwell and disturbed. And he was sent to Bow Hill, which had better nursing facilities. But they were unable to cope. He was severely disturbed. Um, and they transferred him to Craig Lockhart with a diagnosis of agitated melancholia. In other words, a psychotic depression, uh, which uh, proved to be not right, as did um, the slip of paper that accompanied him that said, I am confident that once, once he gets to uh, Edinburgh, his, um, hysterical, his markedly hysterical symptoms will improve rapidly. Um, probably not. Craig Lockhart felt that he was beyond their abilities as well, so he was moved on to Craig Lee, which was the military wing of Craig House Hospital, the 
uh, neighbouring civilian psychiatric hospital on the 24th of September. At least there, they recognised that his illness was actually a toxic or infective del delirium. And despite excellent care, he deteriorated. And a week later, he died on his son's third birthday. A review of his clinical and family records, which fortunately Lothian Regional Health Archives were able to produce, and I received a, a pack of some 70 copies of his documents, um, and then there were further documents at the National Archives in London. Um, and a review of the record showed that his apparent mental disturbance is likely to have been due to del delirium from chickenpox encephalitis, because Shortly, be shortly uh, before he became unwell, but unknown to his medical attendants, he'd been in contact with his infant son, who developed a chickenpox rash later that day. His wife had also become infected with chickenpox and was too ill to attend his funeral. He's buried at Morningside Cemetery in Edinburgh, and a war pension was granted to his widow and his infant son. It would have been very easy to draw inc incorrect conclusions about this case. Officer deteriorates mentally, goes into hospital, transferred to a psychiatric hospital, um, dies a week later on his son's third birthday. You have to wonder what happened to him. And it would have been very easy to consider this to have been a probable suicide. But in fact, it's very clear that in that last week, he, he was running a very high temperature and he was clearly very poorly indeed. Um, and it was only the availability of the extensive records that fortunately had been preserved in the archives, which enabled the true story to emerge. We do sometimes have the uh, impression that um, officers in the First World War were um, either career officers or members of the aristocracy, or at least came from military families or wealthy families. And that had certainly been true in pre-war times when commissions had to be purchased at very great cost and were therefore out of range to anybody other than someone with a private income. But during the war, it was by no means universal especially later when losses had been so great that there was a need to recruit officers from a wide range of backgrounds. One example is this gentleman whose father was Donald MacLeod, the well-known bagpipe maker of Tain. He went to Edinburgh University where he was a member of the OTC, but in 1916 he was commissioned um, and he served with the 123rd Siege Battery of the Royal Garrison Artillery. He was wounded in August 1917 in France and although he recovered physically, his nerve was shattered and he went on to develop neurasthenia, as many did, and he was admitted to Craig Lockhart. From there, he went on to Lennel to convalesce. He never recovered sufficiently to return to duty, and he was medically discharged from service in July of 1918, and he was awarded the Silver War Badge. The Silver War Badge was issued from September 1916 to United Kingdom and British Empire service personnel who had been honorably discharged as a result of wounds or sickness sustained on service. It was to be worn on the right breast of civilian dress, and originally it was intended to be a public recognition of loyal service, but quickly it became protection for the wearer against the unwelcome attention of members of the Order of the White Feather, who were vigilante women usually, who sought to publicly embarrass men whom they, they saw walking around in civilian clothes, and they believed should be fighting but weren't in uniform, and they used to present them with white feathers, symbolizing cowardice. Sometimes we wonder what a world we live in today, but was it any different in those days? We just didn't have TikTok or X. Over a million of these badges were issued between 1916 and 1922, a stark reminder of the human cost of conflict. But to return to Torquil MacLeod, after the war, he finished his studies at the university and he qualified as an engineer. And he went on to work all over the world including in Nigeria and in Sierra Leone. But then in 1960, his father died, and at that point, he took over the family business um, as a musical instrument maker. These were the early days of flying, of course, and this case um, involves somebody who was injured in a flying accident. Lieutenant Everard Leslie Campion Wilt was born in India on the 11th of October 1898, where his father was a tea planter. He joined the London Scottish in February 1915 as a private soldier, and he was commissioned in November of that year. 
He initially served up here um, in the Edinburgh area with the 4th Defence to October 1916 when he transferred to the Royal Garrison Artillery for flying duties. He crash landed though behind British lines in France, south of Lanicourt Marcel on the 6th of April 1917 while he was flying with, as an observer in an albatross of 15 squadron um, following a dogfight with the re renowned German fighter pilot Lieutenant Werner Voss. The pilot was injured but managed to bring the aircraft down safely although it was written off. Lieutenant Gwilt flew twice more over the next few days, but gradually he became so shaky that he was unable to write while he was in the air. And of course, for an observer, he was meant to be observing where the enemy positions were, writing them down, and then giving them to the planners when he got back down uh, on, on, on land. So he was transferred to an anti-aircraft battery for ground duties, but eventually he was admitted to number eight general hospital at Rouen with nervous debility and diagnosis of valvular disease of the heart, which we mentioned earlier. He was evacuated back home to Craig Lockhart and then went to Lennell on the 25th of October 1917. He was very keen to resume flying though, um, and he was discharged back to duty on the 18th of December. But um, later he relinquished his commission on the grounds of ill health on the 2nd of April 1919. So by then the war was over, but many people continued to serve for several months after the end of the war. After the war, though, he worked for Glaxo, the pharmaceutical company, where eventually he became a, a director. And then during the Second World War, um, he served with uh, the Special Operations Executive, the people on sneaky beaky duties. Um, his file has now been released, and I'd love to see it, um, but I haven't been back to uh, the National Archives recently. I can't finish this talk without including the shield of Lennell's best-known patient, Siegfried Sassoon. His story is too well known to need recounting today, but there's no doubt that he was one of Lennell's more colourful characters. He was admitted after his second stay at Craig Lockhart, not the first occasion when he wrote the contra controversial letter, and um, it was decided that perhaps he ought to uh, be treated for his mental health rather than court-martialed, but the second occasion when he was recovering from, unfortunately, being accidentally shot in the head by his own sergeant while he was returning from a night patrol. So, to wrap up, what we found was that although this project was originally conceived to explore the heraldry, it's provided valuable ins insight into the long-term trajectories of the officers who developed neurasthenia and other related conditions during the First World War. And as you can probably appreciate from the small number that we've been able to look at today, out of the 259 shields that we have, Despite their problems, many of them did very well in later life. That's not to say that they didn't experience nightmares in later years. Many did, but they were able to somehow cope and come to terms with it and return to normal life. And I'd like to think that there's a reassuring message here for today's veterans who may be suffering from PTSD, that it doesn't have to be a life sentence. The Heraldry Project also provided convincing illustration of the importance of keeping the mind occupied with enjoyable pastimes ideally in shared company. So you might like to reflect briefly on a few questions and consider whether there's any lessons that we could apply today. Are some mental health outcomes poorer today than, than they were after the First World War? The evidence would suggest they might be. However, we mustn't forget that some people certainly were left with long-term disability. And in fact, one of the officers who'd been at Lennell turns up later um, as the medical superintendent of a long-term hospital, looking after other officers who had much more long-lasting mental health problems um, two or three years after the end of the war. But have we actually become too much, too focused on therapy? Are we reinforcing the sick role too much? Should we have more emphasis on just renormalization and returning to that normal world? And Sir Frederick Mott's principles of treatment from well over 100 years ago actually still seem valid today. So what can we learn from the lessons of history? Well, perhaps if we forget them, we might have to just repeat them, and that would be very sad. But we leave the last word to Siegfried Sassoon in a letter that he wrote to Lady Clementine in October of 1918, shortly after he left Lennel. When there's another war, and all my sons and grandsons have got bow and arrow shock, I shall, I shall recommend Lennel to their notice. 
but I don't suppose they'll believe their poor old granddad when he says it was the nicest place he went to in the Great War. That, I think, says it all. And it just rem remains for me to acknowledge the contributions of very many people who've contributed to this project so far. Their help has been invaluable. Thank you very much.